So it's like you just really got to keep it pushing, keep it going. Even when you think nobody's looking, folks are looking. And I mean, that's the beautiful thing about being an artist. You really got to want to do it. Like, you can't want to do it just for the money. Like if you're doing it for the money, then art might not be the career for you, especially early in the beginning. But you really got to love what you're doing. What's going on, Glorifiers? I'm Mariah Elise. This is another Dear Glory conversation. And I welcome you to join us for this illuminating talk with Demetrius Wilson, an abstract artist whose work is a compelling exploration of emotion, movement, and the workings between abstract and figurative forms. Today's dialogue is sparked by Wilson's significant contributions to the In Tender Peaks, Grace Unfolds group exhibition. Alongside of Demetrius, this exhibition features artists like Megan Lewis, Lex Marie, Lamont French, Kobe Dill, Ryan Williams, Travion Payne, Von Davis Jr., Crystal Yar Anthony, Dusabe King Christian, and Okoye Emika John, curated by myself and presented by Mitochondria Gallery in Houston, Texas. Demetrius graced us with two compelling 2023 All on Canvas works, Watch From Afar and Flash. And I'ma say this, they're both found a new home, okay? One of the homes I'm super happy I'll be able to visit. Demetrius being a feature artist in this exhibition led to us having this conversation about his practice and his journey into becoming the artist he is today. Listen, Demetrius also was just mentioned by Artsy as one of the 29 emerging black artists to discover this Black History Month. It was written by Isis Davis Marks. And if you know, you know, a RC feature, it's a really big deal. They even mentioned the exhibition, so that was super cool too. Demetrius was born in Boston in 1996, and now Wilson has emerged as a formidable force in New York City's art scene. He also just opened his first solo exhibition at Harper's Books called Begin the End, which opens Thursday, February 22nd. It's safe to say he's doing real big things. He's had exhibitions all over the world. I'm talking about in Rome. So he's earned the title of being an international artist. Challenging and expanding the boundaries of black abstract art, his artistry speaks a language of resilience, dialogue, and accessibility, melding together narratives that bridge disparate worlds and experiences. Our conversation with Demetrius revealed the depth and the dynamism of his artistic process, touching on the integrity of art collectors, the evolution from trauma force figurative narratives to broader thematic explorations, his advice to fellow artists, and the influence of Rasheed Johnson's notion of didactic art, which simply means instead of aiming to teach or preach specific lessons or values, he prioritizes exploration, ambiguity, and open-ended interpretations in his work. In this episode, we explore how Demetrius Wilson captures the essence of movement, displacement, and the fragmented nature of memories in his art. His refusal to get wrapped up in nostalgia allows him to approach his memories with a fresh perspective, offering insights into the complexities of identity, history, and the human condition. At the heart of Demetrius's practice, his distinctive approach blends abstract art with figurative elements, creating figures that exist around this whirlwind of emotion and chaos. And it's articulated through rapid and expressive strokes. You'll even learn that Demetrius began his career making pure figurative work. This chaotic environment surrounding the figures in his work is pivotal to Demetrius's narrative, reflecting his perspective his perception of life through fragments. The fragmented nature of his memories, the central theme in his exploration, it speaks to the way that he pieces the past the present and the future. Just two days before this interview, I had the absolute pleasure of visiting Demetrius of his studio in New York. Our conversation was full of laughter and it was about his creative process and his evolution into art. It set the stage for this exploration into his work. I got the chance to put my eyes on the work that he was creating for Intender Peaks and that was really special. The joy of reconnecting was amplified when Demetrius came down to Texas for the opening reception for In Tender Peace, Grace Unfolds, where he also participated in the artist talk. We had such a good time getting to know Demetrius and his fiance amongst all the other artists that came down to Houston. I want you guys to join us as we journey through Demetrius Wilson, uncovering all of the layers and the meaning within his work, his approach to abstract art with figurative nuances, and the conversation his pieces initiate. He even gave some really special shout outs at the end. And oh, I got something real special for y'all as an intermission. It's the installation video of the exhibition. I hope you stick around and watch that. And look, if you've been loving the work that we do to amplify and educate artists and art world information, make sure to subscribe to this channel. 
The more you click those buttons below, the better and the more robust our content can become, which provides you guys with more information surrounding the art world. If you really feel compelled, hit that super thanks button too and leave a tip. It all goes back into this channel. Let's get into this combo. Demetrius, how are yeah. you? I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm here. It's good to see you. Likewise, good to see you again. I got to see you over the weekend. That was a blessing. Yeah, you came to New York. New York, it, I, one, it was just nice to have you in the studio. And two, you, you finally saw the work in its natural element. So that was definitely nice. And it's beautiful work. I, I, It's one thing to see things on pictures, but it's another thing to be close, be able to talk to you about the work. And it's right in front of you. And we're like not in a gallery setting. So we actually have yeah, we're right. actually able to have a real conversation. So that was nice. Thank you for having me. Now, for sure. Thanks for coming through. So I really want to get into um, some of your work, talk about you, your background, what some of your influences were, and uh, I hope you're ready to get deep with me. <laughs> the whole bag, let's get into it. <laughs> I'm always searching and digging for vulnerability, so let's 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 get into it. So yeah. I really want to reflect on your childhood, mm. and in reflection of your childhood and you growing up in Boston. How have your early experiences and cultural background shaped who you are today? Mm -hmm. I want to start with who you are, mm -hmm. because I know that's leading into the artist that you are. For sure. Yeah. So like you just said, I'm from Boston. Like I'm actually from Boston. Yeah. Because like, like, you know, when folks are all from Boston, but they really be from like Worcester, like, you know, like 45 minutes out, they're not really from, you know, where I'm from. But yeah, Boston is... Boston is like one of those towns that are still, you know, very much segregated. Um, it's funny because every time I tell people I'm from Boston, they're like, damn, I know it's racist. Crazy it racist. Man. That's Boston. what people tell me. But they, I, but I know what areas they're going to. Yeah. Um, but like where I'm from, it's pretty much the people that just look just like me, black and brown folks. Um, so that's kind of what I'm accustomed to. Um, up until I got to college, that really mm. changed, that kind of rocked my world, and for mm. a bit, it was kind of hard transitioning to that. Just yeah. like, just like different kind of cultures. I mean, I grew up around different kind of cultures, but like different kind of cultures and different kind of ways of living um, took some time. But yeah, I'm from Boston, been there for about uh, 25 years, and now I'm in New York. But um, I mean, my mom's from Haiti, my father's from Alabama, so. You know, I got a kind of like a myriad, uh, uh, a plethora of kind of my own different many cultures and my own uh, making uh, makeup. But yeah, you know, I mean, you know, not crazy. I am a twin, and I have a couple other younger brothers. Um, but talk about that. I mean, because first of all, we had a crazy encounter. <laughs> that is crazy. I that, to this day, I'm still shook. I was like, how? Oh, oh. Okay. When I called you Darius, we were first talking. We hadn't even had a, a had we had we hadn't even had a phone. We didn't call even yet? chop it up like we that. hadn't even talked yet at all. And I called you Darius, and it was like I felt so bad after I called you Darius. And then you said, "No wait, my I have a twin, and his yeah. name is Darius." Exactly. For those who don't know, I'm a twin, like I just said, and my brother's name is literally Darius. Yeah, I'm probably like one of the most generic, you know names that you can't have but that's his name and when she called me that, I was like wait how do you know that because I don't tell nobody that <laughs> I really don't tell nobody that unless they really know me so like that kind of like shook me but yeah yeah there's also this I mean I don't want to say that there's this thought of duality mm. even that you may have grown up with mm. does that play into your work at all the duality as in like what in the fact that you were born with someone else yeah yeah. Like you guys may not have grown up the exact same. I mean, me and my brother, we have a very similar uh, upbringing. Like that's he's really like one of my closest. I mean, like that was like my first friend. Like we came into this world together, yeah. did a lot together. Um, and, you know, we went through a lot of experiences together. So, yeah, I mean, but we also experienced those same things very differently mm -hmm. uh, because we kind of view things very differently. Right. Um, so, I mean, the duality is a thing that does play a huge part of my work. I mean, I kind of like to label myself as like a hypocrite um, when I'm talking to work, but I think it's really just like me kind of like rubbing off like my, maybe like my own brother's experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to look at things through a different lens while still kind of holding on to minds 
in a selfish and greedy kind of manner, but I need that for the work. Um, yeah. No, duality is like a huge component. Um, and I'm still trying to become a little bit more familiar with that in my work. In what ways does your Haitian, because you grew up, you said your mom is Haitian yep. and your dad's from Alabama. So you got some Southern roots in there. Those are both really, really strong influences. <laughs> sure. Now it's very low the, in history. I can imagine being in a household with a Haitian mom mm. and a Southern dad mm. and the South just like ramming and like trying to come out and want to eat specific food. And then your mother is like, no. <laughs> exactly. It's honestly, it's, it's so funny because like it's such chaos. It was such chaos growing up in that house. Um, I mean, my father from Alabama, he moved here pretty young, but like you could tell like, his upbringing and his roots and the way he lived his life in Alabama, um, I mean, it very much kind of stayed with him and how he thinks and how he does certain things. Yeah. In, conjunction with my mom, in conjunction with my mother, she also moved to the States when she was very young. Um, so she's kind of like Americanized in a way. Like it was yeah. easy for her to kind of adapt to a lot of the American cultures, but like she's very much still Haitian. But it's funny because like I'm, it, it, it saddens me because my mom didn't teach me or my siblings the language. Um, because my father didn't want us to learn. I don't know, maybe because he didn't want mm. us to put us back behind his back. But that's just like I feel like that's like one component that I really lost that I kind of I mean it could have I could it could have really helped me in my practice in a way that I probably I mean I would never know. Mm. Um, mm. That's interesting. And, and we can get into this later, but you you talk often about the language, like you having this abstract, you wanting to switch from such a figurative language to an abstract language. Right. And, and maybe we can explore this later, but I wonder if intrinsically that has something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I just, I don't know. I think once I made the shift to abstraction, one, I mean, once once I started painting abstraction, I think I started looking at everything as like a language. Cause like in a way, like you're trying to communicate concepts, ideas, memories, these moments with an audience that's not quite familiar with you um, and your life and, you know, the way your practice is. So yeah. So I kind of look, I like to look at, I'm trying to generalize things as a language. Um, and I mean, it's like one of the, one of the many ways as humans and just like as beings on this world that we communicate through a plethora of ways. Um, and that's kind of how I identify painting. Um, so we're going to get into that later. Cause I have, we'll get into it, I want to, I want to go deep into that one. Cause it, 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 ab abstract language and figurative language is so different in, and, and you speak also about spoon feeding so i don't i want to get into that later yeah. I think it's, it's a major uh component to your work um but i do want to talk about this transformation that you made from boston to massachusetts mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then to new york yep. and how those two transitions have had an effect on you personally and on your work yeah so uh, yeah i mean like honestly like once I went to college, I realized like how similar Boston and New York were. I mean, I went to school in Worcester, which is like an hour away from Boston. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the folks that went there were from New York. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, like Boston's obviously so much smaller, but when you're in there, it just feels so much bigger. And that's all I really knew up until a point in time. Um, I mean, it's funny because like after I graduated, I still kind of managed to find a way to crack the art scene. Um, I had a gallery that I was working with and it took forever to work with that gallery. And that's just like, and I realized the processes of working with galleries are far different now that I'm in New York. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started working with a gallery and things out there, it's just a little bit slower. Uh, mm -hmm. And then coming to New York, the transition, honestly, it felt very easy for me to do because I knew, I, I mean, I already, if you look at my paintings, like they're kind of quick, but they're not, I mean, they take time to create, but looking at it from first glance, it's just like, it's super loaded with movement. It just yeah. looks fast. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of how I live my life mm -hmm. uh, and kind of how I like things to be. I, I mean, I talk fast. Maybe that's from like my Southern roots. Um, I just yeah, Southern don't. roots, we talk, you know, I live in Texas. We talk a little, we, we, we're a little slowed down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, certain parts of the South, you know. Yeah. Certain parts. Um, but yeah, I mean, Coming from Boston to New York, there's just this, this shift in speed, mm -hmm. this shift in scale. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's just so much more happening around you. In Boston, everything just seems so isolated. Um, and you kind of know everybody because it's really just like one segregated area. 
yeah. and you're bound to run into folks. Um, so in that regard, the experiences are pretty uh, pretty wrapped up. Like you kind of know what you're going to get into, even if it's a surprise. It just kind of comes with it when being in Boston. First, it's coming to New York. It's just like one. It's just a whole new world. Mm-hmm. I've been there for a couple of years now, um, so I'm pretty adapted, and you know, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, yeah. But there's just so much always going on, and just like at times, it's kind of hard to balance it. Um, but I want to be in the mix. So, I kinda, how big is Boston? Is it is it is it big? I don't know. Boston's pretty big, though. It is. Like I'm talking like a small, but like in comparison to a lot of other like cities, I mean, obviously compared to like a Houston, yeah, like it's, it's like a baby. But I yeah. mean, Boston is pretty pretty big, but like in the grand scheme of things, it's really just a small kind of area. Okay, well, here's a question: How long does it take to get from one side of Boston to the other side of Boston? I mean, it depends on where you're trying to go. Like Boston, in a way, you could kind of compare it to like New York and like how it has boroughs. Mm. Like you have Mattapan, you have Dorchester, you have Roxbury, Hyde Park, and all these other areas. Um, I mean, we'd only have really like four major train lines compared to like in New York, which is like you could get on the train at like any block, and yeah. in Boston you have to get on at like a certain station, and then you just kind of like ride around. So it really, it, it, it could take some time. Yeah. Hour, okay, thirty minutes. Like okay. it, it take. It takes some time, whereas New York is like, you need to go over there. All right, it might take like 15 minutes. Yeah. Even okay. walk. So I understand. I understand now because from coming from Houston and going to New York and spending time in New York, we drive everywhere. Like public transportation is not a thing here at yeah. all. So you grew up with public transportation being central in your yeah. life. Okay. Yeah. So the so the similarities, it's a little bit slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I but to me, I think it was a little bit bit more of a surprise because folks was like, man, like MTA is like so difficult. But then I got here, I was like, man, what the what is y'all talking about? It's yeah. like <laughs> if you need to get on this train, just go over there. It's literally on the block. You ain't gonna go to no certain station. Yeah. And I mean the stations are like pretty much on every corner. Yeah. Whereas like Boston it's like you only have four stations. Okay. And so it's like in Boston, I say this like in New York, you don't really need a car. You could, but you don't really need to. I mean there's a lot of expenses with it now. Yeah, you got that whole going on, but whatever. That's about to happen. Where in Boston, like you could take the MT, you could take the MBTA, or you can just drive around. It's actually easier to drive around, but it works. Take the maybe that's just an East Coast thing. Yeah, I wonder how difficult that was for your dad. You know, transitioning from Alabama because like, you drive, you walk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my yeah. dad, he like walking everywhere. So okay. Oh, that's a good thing. Uh, in that regard, Boston was good for him. He literally be walking from downtown to the house. For uh, folks that know Boston, from walking from downtown to Roxbury, that's a true. Like that's like an hour and a half walk, and he oh. makes that work religiously. So, so that's like three miles. It's it's I don't know. He be he be, <laughs> he be moving. So yeah, <laughs> we got to get your dad a bike. <laughs> now nah, my dad, he, his legs ain't working like how they used to. Yeah, so he got uh, a cane now, so he can't be walking them distances. Oh man, we got yeah, we got to get him take a. a, 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 a he <laughs> we gotta get him a scooter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but scooter today is actually his birthday. So oh, gotta, but happy yeah, birthday, yeah. Dad! <laughs> birthday pops. Got that's it. cool. That's cool. You want to give your daddy a birthday shout out? <laughs> and now uh, shout out to you know Edward Wilson. That's my father. He gave me his middle name. Uh, he turned sixty today, y'all. Oh man, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Well, I want to talk about your background a little bit and reflecting on your journey. What were some of the pivotal moments that significantly shaped your path in, I want to say, the art world? On this channel, just a little background for you. We really talk about breaking down the art world, you know, as an artist and sharing some of those pivotal moments that may have changed your journey in, um, in your actual career. I think that would be really beneficial uh, for the people that are watching. Yeah, I feel like my journey, it's so much more relatable to like, to those who didn't really grow up with art being like the, the their primary focus. Like, cause I feel like a lot of artists and for a period of time, like I kind of like felt very envious of it. I was like, damn, I wish I would have got it to it sooner. But like a lot of artists, they said, like, I started creating when I was like three, like I have the pencil in my hand, the paintbrush. And I was like, damn, like 
you really had an advantage because like you knew what you wanted to do immediately. And so you had more time to hone your 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 craft, your style, your voice. Um, but for me, that wasn't the case. I mean, I was very artsy. Um, I remember like anime was like one of the first artistic influences that I was um introduced to. I mean, just like mm-hmm. watching cartoons, watching TV, like cartoons and anime, like those were like my first real introductions to art. I remember just tracing things against the window, like with the light. Um and just drawing and using watercolors, my mom would buy us. Um, so, I mean, like, I've done art kind of things, but it really wasn't, like, anything serious for me. It was really just something to pass the time. And mm-hmm. I thought it was cool to make my own images that I could just hang. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm, and then I really only remember taking, like, one art class up until I got to college. Mm-hmm. And that was in third grade. And I don't even remember what the hell I was doing in that class. Wow. Um, I didn't even really have a good time. It's just, like... And that's another thing, like, you know, you ain't got no kids. I feel like kids ain't got the funding to really get into, like, these artistic programs. Now it's changing, but when I was growing up, it definitely wasn't a thing. So yeah. I, I didn't even go to museums. I ain't really have anything like that. I didn't really have that that opportunity. And then I got to college, and a lot of then my world really just opened up. Um, and I'm not here to tell folks to go to college to, you know, be yeah. introduced to these girls. But for me, it really was an opportunity to kind of get introduced to a new viewing of life and a new viewing of opportunities. Um, And I think that's when I really kind of hit it off with art. I mean, I don't know if I told you a story, but like 2015, I was a sophomore in in college um, and and I didn't declare my major yet. I was like, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I had to declare going into my sophomore year. Um, And I figured, I thought I like, I I think I had like an an idea that I liked art, but I wasn't sure yet. Yeah. Um, I was thinking like, I was thinking like of a long term, like, you know, like the financial things and just like what people would say about me being an artist and just like mm-hmm. do it like you set yourself up for failure. Um, so a lot of that kind of like played in the back of my mind I was as I was frequently thinking about this decision. And I mean, I stayed up I stay up pretty late in the summer times, not gonna lie, because I'm not going nowhere. I mean, I was working, but I wasn't going nowhere. Yeah. Um and I was watching a couple documentaries. I was watching this Andy Warhol documentary, it was cool. I was just like Back then, I was I wasn't like one of them Andy Wall haters. I wasn't like I was kind of like, man, this ain't art. Like anybody could do that. I was one of them people. I'm not gonna lie to you. Yeah. I was one of them. <laughs> um, and then I saw a John Michelle Basquiat documentary, and not really, it kind of that kind of hit like a switch for me. Yeah. And I mean, Basquiat. I mean, you you talked about him. Oh yeah, you talked about him. But yeah, <laughs> Basquiat is like one of those artists that really started kind of like. Gaining a lot more attention within like the past 10 years um, towards him and his work. Uh, I mean, celebrities such as Jay-Z and Beyonce and all of them, like they really started holding on to his work. But yeah, I saw the documentary and I was like, man, there goes this this person who has a similar background to me, um, you know, middle class. Like he was, he just had, he, he chose to be homeless and he chose to leave that, uh, live that bohemian lifestyle uh-huh. of his, for his, his work. We, I didn't have to do that, and I didn't do it. But we <laughs> came up similar backgrounds. Like he's also Haitian, um, Puerto Rican. I'm not Puerto Rican, but I'm Haitian. But yeah. um, so I identified with him. We resonated, and I was like, "Man, if I can see this dude do what he did in a short amount, and he only had like really five years of doing what he did up until his death." And yeah. I saw that, and I was inspired. I was like, "Imagine what I can do and what I can become if I was to." carve out this chunk of time and mm-hmm. really like dedicate my life and my craft to this. I mean, like the opportunities will be endless. Yeah. Um, and so from that moment on, I really declare to being an artist, like whatever that means, um, really just being creative. Um, and I haven't really looked back. The conversation about Basquiat is so interesting to me because first of all, like you said, he didn't have long to develop. Like he really didn't develop. You know, if if you really think about it, like you think about the fact that people have like lifelong journeys as an artist, they are developing every single year. He really did not have a chance to develop. So even the critique against his work is is, it's against an artist that hasn't even totally and completely developed. Yeah. And also. I feel like we're in this time where people don't want other artists work to look like Basquiat. Like you can be influenced by, you can be influenced. Like we were talking about Cecily Brown and an artist that I work closely with. 
you can you can yeah. be influenced by Cecily Brown and it's not a problem. And right. people just make that connection and say, oh, this is reminiscent of Cecily Brown and I love it. And yeah. that's where it ends, right? Like you can find that artist's own language in their work. But for some reason, anytime we see an artist doing like neo-expressionism work, it gets put in this box of, oh, they just want to be like Basquiat instead yeah. of looking at the artists, seeing their influence, also seeing their influence from other artists and finding that artist's language amongst the influence of Basquiat. I think it has a lot to do with him being a black artist and being one of the only yeah. successful black artists in that comparison. But I think it's ridiculous that we do that to artists that are influenced by him. And it's a direct influence. Like, like you're influenced by him. Yeah, Your yeah. Wife I mean, like, doesn't look like his at all, but yeah. you know, the story it used to. It used to, it, and I and I definitely resonate with that that sentiment of what you're saying. Like, I think it's. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, like artists too, and and I don't think it's like a bad thing. I think it's quite helpful. It's a tool to really like one get familiar with the the language and really get familiar with your own voice. Um, see what you like and what you don't like. And we have these conversations like, I love Cecily Brown's work, but there's some things I, that I'm not a huge fan of. So I take the things that I do like and I'll try to mold it into my own voice. Yeah. Um, doing it's called this stealing like an artist. <laughs> so, you know, like it, it happens. And I and I manage to steal from these other artists and I put it all together. Um, yeah, I think it uh, it is kind of whack that you can't really look at. I don't know why. I don't know why Basquiat is treated like that. Um I don't know. I do. Picasso all the time. In <laughs> I fact, know. Like, I feel like go from Picasso all the time. So nobody was saying nothing. But all the time. I mean, which George Condo? <laughs> I mean, like you know, like <laughs> it's ridiculous. But, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. But I do like that you said that because I think that's a really good lesson in saying you take from. I mean, because we all take. Like, there's no way that we're not taking, and that we, yeah. we're influenced by so many images and voices and things all day long that we have to take but what you said is you're taking from different artists mm -hmm. to create your own voice in your own language i mean and they I set in a is... template like they giving they literally already endured a lot of the th things and they got to that point and they just yeah. just like it's not fair for it to really just go by the wayside like you might as well utilize it it's a resource so why not take advantage of it i'm not saying steal their whole style and just make you know, renderings of their work, but like you right. can definitely utilize it as a, you know, as a visual study guide. A visual um, study guide. I like right. that. So during your career, have you paid, have you, have you come in, have you faced any periods that really tested your resolve? Like have, have you had experiences that influenced your artistic expression that taught you about resilience? Yeah. I mean, even just coming out of undergrad, I mean, I think coming out of undergrad, I really, that was like the first time I really understood like what folks were saying, like the starving artist. Like, I mean, like I never really understood it until I actually became a part of it. And I mean, by no means was I was like starving, but like, I I think it was, it's not necessarily starving. I think it's like more so just like getting it out the mud, like really just like grinding and just trying to really put things together while still trying to maintain a lifestyle. And I, after undergrad, I think for me, that was very difficult. And I never I, I, I wouldn't say that I ever wanted to give up, but I was like, I definitely doubted myself and questioned myself, like, yo, is this really the right thing that I want to do? Because mm. uh, I was miserable in doing the work that I was doing because I wanted to make art, but I had to do other things in order to kind of sustain my practice. Mm. So that was like probably like the first time I really encountered like challenges. And then coming to New York before coming to grad school, um, I mean, coming to, coming into grad school. Like, I thought I, I knew what I wanted to do within my practice, but then it kind of just all got obliterated, and I kind of had to start from scratch. Mm. Uh, just because I felt like, I wouldn't say I did things wrong, but I felt like I wanted to do things my way. And I was just really just, in the past, I was creating for what other people wanted or what mm. I thought they were like, mm. rather than creating for my own personal desires or my own personal um, appreciation. Mm -hmm. um so what changed really what changed when you started creating for yourself versus creating for other people in a way one i feel like 
what I was trying to communicate felt way more authentic uh, because it was coming from me and it wasn't just coming from the voices of others. And it wasn't just, I wasn't just like talking about like what was hot in that moment. Um, so I stopped really following trends um, because I felt like you had to do that in order to kind of keep up the conversations within what was going on. Um, I mean, I'm still able to do that, but in a way that feels applicable and natural and it works for me. Mm. Um, but I think it really just like a lot of things became more authentic um, and I started to have fun with it. Mm-hmm. And that's like a huge thing that I tell a lot of artists and a lot of people who want to, you know, be artists or even make this a career. It's just like the moment you start having fun, it's just like, why even do it? Yeah. It's like anything in life. Like why, why torment yourself and be miserable doing something that you know you don't want to do? Yeah. Uh, I know you got to survive, but at the same time, you still, still try to find ways to end up doing what you want to do. And it, and what I believe is just like, if you're doing what you love to do, even though you're not being successful and like, you know, financially, I think you, that's a part of your dreams. Like you're living your dream, like you're doing what you want to do. Um, and I think that's just as important. You said a few things. First of all, at the beginning, like when you came out of undergrad, you had to do other things to maintain the artistic part of your life. Right. I know so many artists that are like, nah, I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I feel them, right? You know? I feel them too. But what, what's your advice? Like, because it, it can work in so many ways. We, we've heard both stories, right? Like, yeah. we've heard both stories of this one artist that quit their job, put everything on the line, went broke for everything, mm-hmm. and then they end up being such a crazy success. Yeah. We hear it on the other side where the artist maintains a job, it keeps pouring investing in themselves because it the reality of it is let's be real if you don't have a sponsor if you don't have a trust fund if you don't have money coming from somewhere materials cost money even if you're painting and and working with final materials the materials that you're you're still going to spend money on materials right like there's almost no way around it unless you're stealing the materials or they're being donated (laughs) you know in some way so what Given your experience and even the experience of other artists around you, mm-hmm. what would your advice be in that sentiment, in that moment? Should they quit the job? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, could, I could tell you because I've literally been through all that. So I can tell you from where I was to where I am now. And so hopefully what I, where I'm going to continue to be. So like where I was, I undergrad, like, like I said, like I had to do a lot of, you know, I had to actually like work in 95. Um, I was teaching. Um which is something that I would like to come back to in the near future, but just to kind of like see it at the collegiate level. Um, but I was teaching like high school and I was teaching middle school and it was cool, but like I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do in that moment. Not to say that it's something that I don't think you should do, but it wasn't for me in that moment. Um, but I stuck through it. Like I had to do it. Um, and I'm not telling folks to quit their jobs and just go broke because I don't think that's really going to do you any good. Like you need to be have a stable enough income to really do the things you want to do in your practice. Like things are not cheap, especially right now. Like you really need to be able to take care of yourself. And, you know, if you got people that you're looking at, um, you got to take that into account. So for me, I think it was easier because I'm also I mean, I just got engaged to my my fiance a couple months ago. Yeah, we love to hear Um, that. Appreciate it. So <laughs> he's always really been a part of that. So mm. I know that I can know I can't really make those decisions for myself. I can't like certain things. I'm gonna be selfish, but like because I have people that I have in my life, and I know I gotta take care of folks, and I gotta take care of myself. Mm. I gotta be a responsible person. Um, mm. so I'm not finna just quit. So you really gotta. I'll say this: like you really have to sacrifice and understand what it is to sacrifice to get to that part that you want to obtain. Like, there's a lot of, like, I mean, like, I'm really into fashion. I actually wanted to be a fashion designer, but I took the art route. Yeah. Um, so I love clothes. I love anything fashion. But I knew I loved art way more. And I wanted to be an artist that create a successful artist. So I kind of had to really give up certain things. And fashion was one of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew it would come back. And it's it's just like you're sacrificing it for the moment. Things will always come back if you do it, what you need to do um, for that moment. So just give it up for a little bit of time, and then it'll always come back. Um, and the where I'm at right now, I've been fortunate to quit my 9 to 5. Um, really wasn't a 9 to 5 because I'm in school, so 
it's a little hard to really work. Um, but I quit my job last December. So I really went a whole year with just like having art to sustain my lifestyle. That's a um, blessing. That, so it's definitely a blessing. Yeah. I remember I was up until, you know, up until last December, like I was stressing out. I was like, man, like I want to be in school, but it's so hard. But these hours, it's kind of hard to work a nine to five. Mm-hmm. And I was really struggling with like how I'm going like, to pay these bills. Um, but, you know, I I got fortunate. I got lucky. Um, but yes. I wouldn't say like, I'm not saying like I got, I mean, I got lucky, but part of, Part of being lucky is just like being ready for those opportunities. Yeah. Like you can do everything right um, and the opportunity still can't come. So it's just like, what are you going to do when nobody's looking or when the lights are off? So it's like, you just really got to keep it pushing, keep it going. Even when you think nobody's looking, folks are looking. Um, and I mean, that's the beautiful thing about being an artist. You really got to want to do it. Right? You can't want to do it just for the money. Like if you're doing it for the money, then art might not be the career for you. Especially early in the beginning, but you really gotta love what you're doing, um, and I'm obsessed. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, going back to the fashion thing, I just told my husband that I wasn't gonna buy no shoes, no bags <laughs> oh. next year. You know, just you said that. I know, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta keep it. You gotta keep it a beam with you. Gotta yourself. keep it real with yourself, right? So maybe it's like I want to buy as many shoes. And yeah, that. there you go. <laughs> Let's be real now. Let's not lie to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you don't believe in me. I don't. I'm not gonna. Oh lie. man, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. You say you're not gonna buy no shoes, no shoes, no bags, no bags. Hey, we'll see. I'll give you up until March. You just said that we have to sacrifice today for tomorrow <laughs> it take a lot of discipline you don't think i'm disciplined <laughs> hey that's oh, hard man. you've been living a certain way for a while of time you know what i'm sound like a hypocrite you know what you got it in the bag don't even worry about it yeah yeah okay. hold me don't to listen it to me. Don't listen check to in me. with me every now and then make sure i'm all doing right. okay <laughs> all right i'll be down there soon <laughs> you will be down here soon we ain't, we're not gonna let them know why yet <laughs> Yeah, they don't know. They don't need. They don't know why yet. Hey, before we get too far in, I think it might be really cool for you guys to actually see the exhibition. So before we get into the second portion of this conversation with Demetrius, take a look and see Demetrius and other feature artists work installed on the gallery walls. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So I want to get into your creative process. Um, what does it look like from that initial idea, that initial spark of it might come to you in the middle of the night to inception? You know, this my process is just so complex and it's, it's just, it's getting so complicated now, which I think is a good thing because there's always so many avenues that I can pull from. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So in that regard, like I'll never really run out of anything to paint or to create. Um, I think the most challenging thing about that is just kind of like slowing things down enough to me for me to really digest and sit with those ideas because I'm always just going, going, going. Um, but recently I've been taking a break. But my process is, like I said, it's super complicated. Um, I mean, when I'm starting to painting, I like to have a well enough formulated idea of what I'm going to go after. Like the idea doesn't have to be super concrete. I mean, I might just need an image. I might not, I just need some words. I might just need a moment that I'm really reflecting on, like something that's been troubling my or like troubling my spirit, or not, because I'm not making just trauma paintings, but like I need something to really get the gear started. So I think once I get that idea, that image, that moment, then things are pretty much getting beginning started and again getting, getting going. And then once I got that, uh cam is in front of me, and I just get to work. Um, I mean, I'm super layer heavy in my paintings and like I've been questioning myself, talking to my professors because I'm still an undergrad. I finished in the spring. So I've had those resources. But I'm just, you know, like I'm questioning myself. I'm like, do I really need to keep painting this way all the time? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm trying to change my practice overnight in the way I create. But I think at a certain point in the artist's career, I think you always need to be reflective as to how you're doing things. Because I think they could always be as, more efficient. Um mm -hmm. Even if it's a part of your process, or even if that is your process, I think there are certain things you can tweak, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. But it really, does, I really don't need much to really get going on a painting. Um, and I've been also working a lot more in series, which is a nice thing because I don't have to just do one painting on one idea and then another painting on another idea. It's just like I can kind of stretch that idea out and then find subcategories with just like that one idea and keep it going. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I've been doing a lot of my practice. And it's been really plentiful. And I've been super satiated um, in a lot of those, um, you know, shifts that I've been making in my process. Mm, I love that. So it sounds like your your practice is evolving. Yeah, which yeah. is good because I, I it's it's hard to really and I'm saying it's I keep going back and forth because like I'm saying like you want to really take the time <laughs> to understand your process, but it's hard when you're really in the thick of it. When mm -hmm. things are going good, you're in the zone and just like things are looking well. But like as an artist, you always want to push and challenge yourself. Um, I'm not saying like you always got to switch things up by how they look in your work. But like it's always nice to see like how you could do things differently. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's part of evolving. So I'm always trying to do that. You said something really interesting about you're not into creating uh, trauma paintings. Can you expand a little bit on that? You know, I think it's just. At a certain point in time, especially within the history or even like within the canon, I think patrons and collectors and viewers and just like the audience, they just got so accustomed to black and brown bodies. I mean, I'm a black artist, so just getting used to like black artists really just creating these paintings about our own trauma, um, mm -hmm. things that are not going great in our life. It's just like these terrible moments that we tend to just have to relive in order to really translate it on, on, on in a painting or on a work. Mm -hmm. for the viewer to really just sit there and digest and they're in awe. They're like, wow, this is beautiful. But to you, it's just like, yeah, you created something beautiful out of something that is horrific, but mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you kind of have to relive that moment. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it after a certain point in time, like that becomes super heavy for somebody. And I don't want to just keep making these kind of paintings. And I mean, coming into Hunter, like that was something that I struggled with my first semester, like, because that's all I knew. Like, I was making trauma paintings. I was making mm -hmm. paintings about my life and like these terrible moments. And I was showing people in the audience, and they was like, wow, these are incredible paintings. But for me, it got to a point in time, I just didn't want to keep doing that. And then I tried to shift, and they was like, yo, what the hell is this? Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you why are you deviating from what you have been so successful in doing? But it's just like, I don't want to always do that. I don't want to make these trauma paintings. Because it's not, that's not the, the Black experience in entirety. That's part of it. I mean, that's part of everybody's experience. It's part of our experience a little bit more than a lot of people, but like, you don't always have to do that or like what other people expect. And that's kind of when I started making a little bit more shift that I talked about earlier um, in terms mm -hmm. of like how, you know, like I'm creating these images for people and myself, most importantly. When you stop making paintings like that and you mm -hmm. shifted over to, I would assume that's when you made your shift from abstract or from figurative to abstract. Uh, yeah. 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 So with that, is do you feel like your work was at one point trapped in 
being questioned about your identity constantly, like over and over and over and over. And now you've kind of been able to free yourself from that in some way. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, I can't even be really upset because like, that's what I was giving everybody. And that's what I kind of like opened myself up to. Like when you make, when you make art, like you're open to critique criticism, like, now, I mean, like, one, you're making these personal works, but, like, you also open the door for people to kind of personally attack you or personally attack these stories that you're making because it's not just about you at this point. Like, once you put it out in the world, it's really just open for whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think for any artist that's doing that, I mean, we all do it, but you got to be a little bit more conscious in that regard. You can't be that super sloppy in that. But, um, yeah, I mean, once I made the shift to abstraction, like, I mean, the shift I made to abstraction, it's part of that. That's not the entire reason, but um, I mean, because I feel like my work is still very much personal. I mean, they still talk about identity, but identity is not the main uh, the main glue that's really holding a lot of my images and works up together anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's something I want to ask you, and you tell me if you're not comfortable answering this question, but when you are, in this regard to collectors and patrons, yeah, when your work goes to a home, like back in the day, like when, when you were doing these figurative trauma paintings, mm. when your work goes to the home of someone who didn't, who could have never shared the same experience. Yeah. And I'm you, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Exactly. How did that make you feel? That yeah. your body was being collected. Your trauma was being collected. Yeah. Did, did that, because I feel a way when when we make those like sales, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's, it's conflicting that something that is so traumatic could res could even resonate. <laughs> you it's know? just like, why? Like, why do you really want these works? Like, why do you want these stories to be displayed in your house? Like, what is the significance? Like, what is it really doing for you? I mean, these are questions that I'm always asking. And I was asking back in the day that I'm still asking now. I was just like, Why? So that's why I'm very, uh, I like to be in tune with like where my works are going, who's interested in my work. I mean, I'm not, I, when I create, I'm not really creating for a specific audience. Like the image is not really being, like the images that I'm, uh, or it's not really being created for a specific audience. Like I'm aware of my audience, um, but it's just like, why? Yeah. Um and yeah, I mean, like I used to feel the way about it, but now because I have a little bit more agency and I have a little bit more um, involvement with a lot in my own practice, like I'm not really just creating for other people or just like I have a lot more buy into my work. Like it doesn't really bother me as much. One, because I'm not really making those paintings anymore. But two, it was just like I haven't understood. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out why, you know, like why people like these kind of paintings. Yeah, um, it's really interesting to me. I, it's something that I struggle with also. Um, especially when you like take a look at the art market and you see what what's selling, you see what countries are buying more, and mm. it's you know just it's it's interesting and and it's not it's it's not that certain groups of people should not have this work. I guess the question just remains why, and I guess you know that's the the importance of knowing where your work is going, like you're saying, and getting to know the people that's buying your work because it's so personal and you don't yeah. always have to know, right? Yeah. But, you know, working with people, how important it is to work with people who keep that in mind. Yeah. You know, that 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 is not this ulterior that they have the, the people that are that are collecting your work, they have integrity. Yeah. This is honestly is getting close. This like this conversation where we're at right now in this moment is really getting close to like why I made my shift to abstraction. Mm-hmm. Um like I don't know if you wanted to ask. Oh, yeah, get again. into it, get into it. Um, but you know, like one of the reasons why I made abstraction, I mean, one, I just felt like my figure the works were a little too, like we used the word spoon fed, like this term spoon fed earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and I heard Rasheed Johnson say the word didactic. And I just got obsessed with that. Like for like my whole first semester, I was like, man, that's just like didactic. Like it's just like, it's too, like it's too revealing, like too soon. Like you can't really sit with it enough. It's just like, mm. it is what it is. Um, and I mean, just going up, like, that's what I was accustomed to. Like in every household that I went, if there was any art in there, it was always representative, figurative. Like I think just like, and I don't want to talk in the general term, like in the general way for all black folks, um, because that's not, that's not what it is. But from my own experience, I felt like because representation of figurative work was so easy to understand, so digestible, 
I feel like that's why um, folks wanted those works in their homes. It's just like you see it, you resonate with it, it, it makes you feel a way and you understand it. That's all you need. You don't really need to get beyond that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's perfectly fine and dandy. I don't think there's anything wrong with it or from, you know, from that standpoint. I'm talking more so just from like the reason why I shifted from creating those images. One, I didn't really enjoy making those works. I just felt like it was, it's just, I didn't feel challenged. Like it just like there was more that I can do. Um, and in abstraction, there's just like so much more that I can embed within the image. Um, without being cliche, um, let alone just from spoon feeding folks, just like what's obvious. And I'm sure like, when people are interested in art, they don't want to just like look at work all the time. That's just like, you know, super obvious. They want to be challenged in some regard. So yeah. I kind of took that on a, from like a personal standpoint, really just trying to incorporate that within my own practice. Because not only was it challenging me, I knew it would be challenging my audience. Mm. Um, the abstraction is so complicated. So that's why uh, context is so important. And it's just nice to like, you know, provide a little context for people that's like actually interested in your story. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that's a little bit why. I really started working in these abstract uh, language, but there is still there are still figures in your work. Yeah, yeah. You just have to find them. Yeah, I'm an abstract painter with figurative qualities. Like the figure is still very much um, a key component of a lot of my works. In fact, like that's usually how I start off a lot of my paintings. Like I have you know like these figures in conversation, um, images that I might be very interested in, or like something that really just like sparks. Um, something within me and I just kind of go off of that uh, yeah I'm not I mean like, I'm an intuitive painter but like for the most part I really need to get into the painting with a figure mm-hmm. a body mm-hmm. uh, because it's just I'm speaking how like you know like figure to work and like it's so resonant it, you're able to resonate with it so easily um, and that's very much still true for me in my practice especially when I'm getting into painting um, yeah I mean maybe that may shift it may become a little bit more abstracted in the long run, but for right now, the figure is very much still a central focus. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons that made me fall in love with your work is I, I was looking at your work and then I started to see these little figures. Mm. And I'm like, oh, wow, it feels that it feels like there's a lot of chaos happening around this figure. And maybe if I wasn't studying your work at the time because I was being a student of it. Maybe I would have missed the figure. Yeah. But when you see the figure, it creates this conversation between, like you said, the body and your your strokes. And and, and like you said, they're so fast, like it it looks fast and it feels emotional. And that fastness combined with that emotion, combined with that body Mm is like, what is what is happening? What? (laughs) Yeah. Like what what are your thoughts? when what is this person or this figure ex- what are they experiencing in this work in this moment you know yeah. yeah i mean i talk i moved around a lot so displacement um movement um environment space those are all important things for me personally and they just really just happen to fall into the work mm-hmm. um, and for these bodies like i like to think of like you know like how like we as humans and beings and animals, how we operate in these environments and these space within conjunction with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and how like, you know, our story can be different even though we're in the same environment or how it can be very similar and we're in different environments. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of that really does interest me. And that's kind of like what I'm looking for when I'm creating and when I'm painting. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just happens to be, I mean like this, all this movement displacement, um, things just become super fragmented and broken down. Mm. Um, But it's because that's the way I'm looking at life. Like I look through life through a very uh, fragmented uh, lens just because, I mean, that's just like how I'm kind of one, that's how I remember a lot of my memories, like things just come back in pieces. Um, So that's kind of how I'm really like looking at my paintings. How Mm. can I put this over here? How can I put this over there? And it still has a a very genuine um, and relevant conversation. Yeah. Speaking of memories, I read something that the, in, in some interview you did, I'm not sure which one, but you spoke about you spoke about referring to your memories and not mm. getting wrapped up in the nostalgia. Mm. And I thought that was really interesting because, I mean, usually our memories are just nostalgic and that's how we refer to them. That's why we love 
hearing specific. That's why we love hearing samples and music. And um, you know, that's why we like referring to old Christmas movies. You know, it's, it's, it's the nostalgia. So I was I was curious to why don't you want to get trapped up in the nostalgia and solely focus on the memory? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I because I'm also writing my thesis. So like now I'm really like breaking down a lot of my practice in a way, in a way that I'm looking at uh, certain images and like why I'm creating these paintings. Yeah. Um, and and I noticed that I do tend to ref- like memory is like one of those uh, resources that I use when I'm starting a painting. Um, reflecting on a certain moment. So like when you think, when people, when folks think of nostalgia, nostalgia is like you're referring back to a specific point in time. Um, and usually there's like joyous memories. Of, there's like joyous feelings associated with it. Uh, but when I'm using uh, those memories, I'm not really looking at it from a nostalgic standpoint. I'm not looking at it because oh, I remember like, when me and my brothers were in the park and we was using water guns and I really enjoyed that moment. So now I want to paint it. I'm not looking at it from that. I'm looking at it from like the core memory. Um, so I'm kind of really disassociating certain feelings and saying, yes, those certain feelings from that memory and just using that memory as a baseboard for the painting or whatever idea that I'm trying to conjure up. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that I don't, it's not to say that I'm doing that. Like I don't really paint nostalgically. Like I may do it like, Sometimes, but it's not something that I'm looking to actively do in all my paintings. Mm. Um, and I'm still trying to understand why. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just, um, I just feel like it makes it a lot easier for me to break certain things, certain things down. Uh, because I feel like if I'm doing it from nostalgia, then I'm just I'm hyper focused on that one moment, and I'm not mm. really trying to branch out. Whereas, like I'm using this memory, I can use this memory, see how maybe other folks maybe can one identify with it and resonate mm. with it. Um, but also mm. I stretch it out in a way that's just super comprehensible for a, uh, an audience. Yeah. You know what? I get that because nostalgia is kind of linear. Mm. Memories, our memories aren't. Nostalgia is shared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I get that. I didn't understand. That makes that sense. Point. I don't know. Like sometimes I'll be talking, but it's like the reason why I'll be talking sometimes is like I'm trying to talk through an idea to make sure it makes sense to me first and yeah. then it makes sense to other people but, yeah no that's why we need other people <laughs> exactly. Exactly. sometimes i'm sitting in my office and i'm thinking through ideas and i'm like did that make i don't know and yeah. when you talk and sometimes if you just have like a sounding board mm. you know like whoever that is and I, I feel that we should be each other's sounding boards like the people that are around us yeah you know but sometimes you just need to get the idea out and when you're done getting it out it's out yeah and you don't even need to act on it for sure yeah. That'd be the best. Yeah. So post graduation, because you're nearing that. I'm there. Yeah, you almost there. I'm almost. You you had this direction when you came into this program. Mm-hmm. Your direction has evolved. Right. You spoke about even evolving either even further. What new direction do you anticipate? your art will evolve into? I want it to be a little bit more concise. Um, I mean, one, abstraction is just such an, it's so new for me. Like, I've been only really painting with this language for, like, a couple of years now um, in comparison to, like, when I started my art journey. So a lot of the things that I'm doing, they're still new, and I'm still exploring the ways of how to do things. Not saying there's right or wrong ways to do it, but I want to have a better grasp of, what it is that I'm trying to articulate and why I'm trying to articulate it mm. and how to articulate it in a way and and, and through a plethora, plethora of ways. Um, I mean, obviously, I think a lot of things may have to change for me to do so, do that. Mm. Or I might have to paint a bit bigger, um, mm. which is funny because when I got into the program, I thought I was already painting big. And then my professor's like, no, you got to go way bigger. Yeah, I thought I went bigger. They're like, "Yo, you gotta go even bigger." So it's just like, <laughs> how big is big? So <laughs> you're gonna I need think, a bigger studio too. <laughs> I need a way bigger studio. So yeah. <laughs> I, that's just like that's an obvious thing that I need to do. But I think it's just probably bringing a little bit more of the vulnerability back into my paintings. Yeah, um, because that left for a period of time, and I'm starting to bring it back. Um, but because it's been such an ex- 
it's been such a, a gap of time since I've done that. I've kind of forgot how to do it in a way that feels very of me, very authentic, mm. um, while still fitting within this language that I've kind of created for myself. Yeah, I mean, in order to be vulnerable, you got to tap into, you, you can't even tap into the world. You got to tap into yourself, like mm. really, really tap into yourself. And something that we were exploring, we are talking, we were talking about like, what 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 are you really feeling? <laughs> right. Right. And I think people are just like forgetting how to feel nowadays. It's just I mean I like I think it's, so. I think yeah. so. Like, oh, we we talked about that, right? Like yeah. just going through social media and like looking at things. We are so des- desensitized to so many things. You certain things don't even strike an emotion for me anymore. And it makes me yeah. question myself. So it's like, how can you bring I think that might be another thing. Like, how can I bring even more humanity into my paintings. Because mm-hmm. um, now, I mean, like, you know, with the, the art market and the shift of the world, I feel like people are just, like, so focused on money all the time. Mm-hmm. They forget, like, why we even make art and arts <clears throat> to connect and resonate with other people. Like, as artists, we're cultural bearers, so we're supposed to be the ones that's really leading and guiding these conversations and really opening the doors for people, um, enabling things for them. And I feel like a lot of that has kind of really been thrown out the window um, due to like you know politics, economics, and just like a whole whole bunch of things. So I kind of want to see that shift in 2024 and beyond. So. Yes, yeah, that's interesting. You know that you say like as artists, you're cultural bearers. I mean, it's the truth. Years and years and years from now, in order to understand a black man that lived in New York in 2023, mm-hmm. the only way that people are going to look and understand that is through film, is yeah. through visual art is through music. I mean, it's through the forms of the mediums of art. That's that's how we are able to, when we look at a, an old movie from the 1970s, the only way they shape that movie is through language, yeah. is through art, is through clothing, style, fashion. It is I think I said music. It, the, the only yeah. way you can bring that film together is through the core mediums of art. So what you say and what you reflect and and what you show the world that yeah. is so important it's just it becomes it's contemporary now but it becomes historical for sure yeah i mean like i'm trying to like create these paintings within this contemporary age but like what does that really mean mm. um especially because i'm so well versed in you know the canon and of art history to them in the past like that was their moment like that's that was their contemporary age but now it's like historical to us yeah um, so, like what are we trying to say at this time for the next generations? Mm. Things that I'm so thinking. striking the right balance and articulating your ideas. Mm. Uh, you, you talked about that a little bit, but do you have one specific piece that you feel like you were able to really articulate your ideas and, and it came out harmonious? Yeah, I mean, I have this one painting. It's probably the largest painting that I have in the studio right now. Um, and... It derived from a moment that happened a couple of years ago. I want to say 2021, which is probably like when I first got into my grad program. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was that moment down at the border. Um, was it the Del Rio um, border in Texas? Mm-hmm. Um, and you have this is like right after the assassination of the Haitian president. And I've never been to Haiti, but those are my people. Um, they share we share, you know, a lineage of history together um, and just seeing like those images those videos of how they were treated. Um, I don't know, it really just like hit me. But then I put that on the back burner for like two years or a year. And I just revisited probably like this past a uh, couple months ago, like probably at the end of my last semester. Um, and it just, I don't know, it just hit. Just like thinking like the the state of the world, um, how I was feeling, really just like tuning into all that and really putting it together into that painting. And most importantly, not trying to think too much um, and just let things kind of happen. And I think I can I, I can honestly say that's probably like by far one of my most favorite paintings mm. um, that I've kind of created within, you know, this realm of abstraction. Mm. Um, because you know what that sounds I, like to me? Huh? That sounds like a moment you tapped into your vulnerability. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's what it was. And I was like, wow, this is I forgot what this felt like. Yeah. So now I want to really try to experiment, explore it a little bit further in this in this new um this new way um yeah. that I'm creating. Yeah. Um and I don't know, things just really start, 
I don't know, like as as artists, like we know, like when that moment, like when you get into the zone, like things really just like you make this move, you put that color there, you put this mark there, things really just start to happen, and then before you know it, like you have a in your eyes like a masterpiece. It's like, damn, like how did I even get to this? Yeah. But the challenging thing after that is like, how can I get back to back into that space? Mm. Um, but yeah, no, that was a really good moment for me. Um, hmm. Is yeah. that process? Is is getting back into that space? Is that lighting a candle? <laughs> is that doing the same thing over and over and over again every time you go into your studio? Is is yeah. it is it um is it allowing yourself? Is it writing hmm. and and reading your writings and and going back into your journal to figure out how was I feeling at this moment for real? Yeah. What what helps what helps you get into those vulnerable moments and and what can and how and even is it draining, you know, um to continue to tap into such vulnerability? I think it's draining outside of that moment. Like when you're in the zone, like when you're like when everything is happening, everything just feels right. I mean, those are like moments that you live for. Like you want to stay in that zone forever. And, and this is like what anybody in any profession, like athletes, when they're in the zone, they're locked in. Um, you don't even feel like you're wasting any moves. Like every move just feels right. It's just, it's just good. So getting into that space, I think it's the most draining part because like I think yeah. one, you're just thinking way too much into like to be honest, like creating and being an artist is just so much more simpler than what it has to be. Like, I feel like a lot of people like overcomplicate things within this practice and not to say like people don't have complicated processes, but like from the root of it all, it's very simple, simple. Um, so I think once you kind of just put yourself back in that arena of simplicity um, mm -hmm. and really just like tune in to what you're trying to do, um, I know it's a lot easier to, you know, to actually get there. Um and sometimes you don't really have to be in the zone. It's just nice. But like, I think it's really just like when you really just let everything go and just create. I mean, that for me, that's what it is. Like sometimes I think way too much yeah. um, on certain things and then I get wrapped up and then I'm just like lost and I'm trying to find my way back into the to, back to the shore. Yeah. Um, but like when I just kind of like let go and just do what I need to do. I'm not saying like I'm painting it in an intuitive way entirely, but like it kind of is. But like. The idea is still there, but I don't have to really think too much about it. Yeah. So we're going to get into, I want to talk about your short-term dreams, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. goals, but dreams. Okay. Um, long-term so. dreams, lifelong dreams. Mm -hmm. So let's start with short-term. So as you look at the next five years, so that's, I don't know what short-term is for you, but short-term for me will be five years. Okay. What are your immediate dreams? Yeah, Our goals. You can you can go goals, but I like dreams um, yeah. for your career, and I want you to separate these two for your career and for your life. And mm -hmm. I want you to really treat this this moment right now. So spend time thinking about this if you have to. Yeah. I want you to spend time like I want this to be a manifesting moment. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So intentionally, what are your in the next five years? What are those dreams? Well, I can't say before I answer that, I can't say that I kind of already accomplished a short term dream that I set for myself five years ago. And that was to one, be in New York and two, to really sustain myself off of my practice. Like I always dreamed about, you know, doing that. And yeah, this past year told me that I could do it and I did it. So that was that. But going forward for the next five years, career wise, I don't care what nobody say. I want to work with a big gallery, and I like working with big galleries. They just make a lot of things easy. So that's <laughs> that's something that I would like to do. And you want to man, you want to put the gallery out there? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. They they know who they are. They okay. know who they are. I'm waiting for them to get to me because yeah. they don't wait for them. Um, so <laughs> I'm just being real. Like that's what I want to do, and it, they just and with with that. I'm the way I said. Why I said that is because, like, one, I'm able to just focus entirely on my practice. Like, I'm I'm living a sustainable lifestyle, but I always there's always more you can do. Um, mm -hmm. But with with that, you need more resources, um, and that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Um, so career wise, that's that's for the next five years, trying to just figure that out and get to that, um, and still do what I'm doing. But personally, um, I mean, I built my partner for. Uh, 
almost eight years. So getting married is definitely like one of those personal goals for me. Um, I mean, I grew up, my parents are married, um, but it's been super complicated for them. So there's not really a lot of examples of, you know, healthy marriages in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, can really stem from. So me and my personal, I feel like me and my, my fiance, you know, we've really made strides in that area and I'm super proud of her and all the things that she's accomplished and how she's been pushing me and how I'm pushing her. So I'm looking, really looking forward to like the next five years with her and just kind of continue to build um, those things of what we've kind of envisioned. Just really just making those moments happen um, for us. Um, so that's kind of like a personal um, and career goals that I have or dreams. So you answered what your short-term dream was. Now I want to focus on your long-term dream. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, you know, long-term is so hard because, like, I feel like, you know, like, you build up for a lot of things in your life. And it's just like, I just feel like sometimes you just working bit by bit by bit by bit, and hopefully you end up at this this thing at the end or, like, you know, later in your life where things are just, it just happens the way that you want it to happen. So I... So I can't. I, I'm struggling to really even think of a long term goal that I have for myself. Yeah. Um, but if I was to say, let's say that's ten years. Yeah, ten years. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to continue to be mentors for you know these you know artists, new or young. Um, mainly because coming into like this world, coming into the art world, and just being an artist. I had to really do a lot on my own. And in the beginning, it was super frustrating and super challenging. One, because I didn't know where I was going to end up. Even mm-hmm. though I had the goal, I just didn't know how to get to that goal. Um, mm-hmm. And it would have been a lot easier if I had these mentors or these influences that were really in direct conversation with me yeah. and helped me out. Um, so in a way, I really, my, one of my long-term girls goals is really just like to eradicate or try to reduce um, the gatekeeping that happens in like the art world, um, mm-hmm. it really open up the accessibility because it's just like there's no reason for people and artists to really be this selfish. I mean, like the resources are abundant. Yeah. Um, I feel like there is enough for everybody. I mean, like you still will always have those at the top. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think those that are at the top should be able to kind of invest with everybody below. Um, yeah. We, you know, long term, I could be one of those at the top that's helping everybody below. It's just like make things super fluid um, mm-hmm. and enjoyable. Like not only are we just like, you know, shifting cultures within art, but like we're supposed to be having fun. And um, I think that's very crucial and important. And I think people should know that um, yeah. ahead of time rather than just kind of getting stuck in the process, stuck in the struggle. It doesn't always have to be like that. Yeah. I, I, and, and just from, just kind of being embedded in in the culture of trying to demystify things and because that's my main practice especially in this space and mm-hmm. on this channel on dear glory is demystifying the art world and really as much as i can do with my experience giving guidance to how to approach the art world and how not to allow it to jade you because it could jade you yeah um to not scare you off and to just have integrity that's that's really the main thing is continue having integrity because yeah. you know, we can we can compare the art world to many entertainment industries. And those industries are, I feel, a little bit more understood than this world, but they hold a lot of the same struggles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, go and watch a documentary about a thousand documentaries about the music world. It really teach you about the art world. For sure. You know, and just people understanding the parallels between art, fashion, film, um, I think would really, and and, and also having people like you that want to demystify it, Mm -hmm. um, especially for black and brown people, because we just don't, we don't have, there's there's almost no, no guidance. Yeah. And it's important. Yeah, I mean, that's also part of one of the reasons why I want to work with, you know, like these larger galleries. It's just like, yeah, these past couple of years, I mean, even within the past 10 years, I mean, there's a lot of there's been a lot of progress in our world. I'm not going to sit here and act like things haven't changed. Like, I mean, like a lot of black and brown artists have finally been getting the recognition and respect and, you know, like the opportunities they deserve. Yeah. So I'm fortunate for that. And I'm appreciative. Um, You know, that's but I mean, 
you know, like you, you hear a lot of things about galleries and it's just like how, like, you know, like the big galleries, obviously they do take advantage a lot of the times. But I think there are a lot of things that also come out on those relationships. So I don't ever want to be like, I don't want to ever be like, oh, like you shouldn't do that. Um, and really kind of like lie to like these other artists because yeah. not everybody's as fortunate. Like some people really need those resources. No, I feel you. Like, I mean, it's 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 a, it's about your approach. It's it's also about how ready you are. Like you said earlier, and when that opportunity comes, having a good team, having good people around you, and yeah. being able to answer the questions that are being asked. I mean, even if it, you, the the thing about agreements is, all agreements are fair when you sign it. Mm-hmm. And the thing about having information is and having the right people around you, which can get difficult, especially if you don't have the resources, yeah. is you have to be able to pull on people to help you understand these things that are coming at you quick and being able to understand yourself what's coming at you quick so that you can make sure that the agreements that you're making and the things that you're going into aren't just fair for the other party, but they're also fair for you. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, when you sign that agreement, that agreement says it's fair. And I think that's what, you know, we talk about 360 deals and and things like that. And, you know, we can go deep into all of that. Yeah. But, you know, and, and, and labels stealing from artists or galleries stealing from artists. We hear these stories all the time. Mm-hmm. And the public is always on the artist side. The court is always on. That's <laughs> business, y'all. But it's hard to it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta know what you're getting into when you get into you know these professions and yeah being like yeah there's there's a lot of good that happens but there's a lot so a lot of nasty that goes behind it but that's just part of the game you gotta be able to finesse it and work things in your favor we have two questions and then we're gonna rapid fire okay 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 so we said short-term dream we said uh, a long-term dream which was 10 years and i want to mm-hmm. know lifelong dream mm-hmm. i mean outside of me wanted to be like one of the greatest steps that does it within my generation. I mean, I'm not going to be Bane and I'm not going to be arrogant, but I definitely do. I mean, a lot of the reasons why we do what we do is because we want to, one, it's a competition and we want to be the best. So mm-hmm. it's something that I'm working on. I want to be one of the best in my generation. And I want to be not only like the best of like what I do, but also the best at being an actual human being um, mm-hmm. to folks. I mean, that's a conjunction with my uh, long-term dream. But, you know, lifetime, I really want to, at the end of my life, I want folks to know that I was a good person and that I actually really looked out and I wasn't really all only for myself and yeah. for my people, um, yeah. like my circle. I don't know. Maybe, I'm, maybe I might have like a, a museum mm. um, just because museum and also want to be a part of like the funding of like, you know, programs in these communities. Um, yeah. And really, so it's like long term and it's not something that can go away. Um, just because, like, you know, I, I lacked out on a lot of things growing up. Um, mm-hmm. And if I had these opportunities and these resources growing up, I feel like I would be way further ahead of where I am right now. Not to say that I've I've done a lot of great things for myself, but I can be even further. Yeah. Um, so looking out for the next generation, um, even though I'm quite cynical sometimes, like new generations, I'm still hopeful. Um yeah. <laughs> That you know things can play a lot in their favor and yeah yeah so just you know things like that yeah I mean we got to be hopeful if we want kids and <laughs> and we're gonna be old one day we're relying on younger generations we have to be open and we have to understand as you know something I think is even crazy in 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 this world too is like we're not I feel like the art world is not uh, switching over to like. I feel like it's still so 1960s. <laughs> I do feel a little old still. I do. I feel real old. So even being in this industry and like making waves and and deciding to be the person that, um, you know, that goes after the glory, not for your own accolades, but to open the doors. You know, like you have to, you have to get to these certain peaks in order to open the doors that you're trying to open for the younger generations. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that. So we recognize that there are so many artists out there striving to find their way, some mm-hmm. facing really, really significant challenges, considering that this channel, Dear Glory, aims to be a resource and a support to artists, collectors, et cetera, 
um, but mainly artists. Could you share three pieces of advice or insights that you believe would help navigate their past and reach their artistic goals? <laughs> Sometimes as an artist, it's necessary to really be focused heavy on you mm-hmm. while still being aware of others. Um, I mean, this is something I'm dealing with in therapy and learning how to be, you know, both selfish and selfless. I think those are, it's two, I mean, it's two different sides of the spectrum, but I think there's very much a balance that can be met in the middle. Um, because like at some points in your, in your, in your career, you really got to like focus on your craft and how to push yourself. You got, I mean, sacrifice um, and be willing to push yourself to get to that next step. But you also have to be aware of others and really be able to help and give back. Um, so there's definitely a balance. So that's mm-hmm. one. Two is um, what I kind of just said is like, don't be afraid to sacrifice. I mean, like you can't be everywhere. You can't do everything um, no matter how much you want. I mean, like we're finite beings. We only have so much time. So just like being conscious of the time that you have and really just making an effort to do the most with it. I'm not saying that you just got to throw yourself into your practice and not live a life. There's a balance, of course. Um, But, you know, be willing to sacrifice and do the things that you don't always want to do in that moment, just for the greater good of your own self and for others. Yeah. Uh, So be ready for that. Just be ready. Um, And lastly, it's just like, have fun. Like being an artist is so challenging and it can be rewarding. But the demands of a lot, it demands a lot. Um, there's a lot of responsibility. There's a lot that comes with it. Um, more than you would even know, um, especially when you first get into it. So it's just like put yourself in the right space to have fun, but also being conscious that you have to fulfill these responsibilities and these duties and these actions. Um, it's just like if you're not having fun, then why even do it? Like why even bother? Um, and I realized like when you're having fun, other people kind of want to be around you. Yeah, um, for sure. They're like, they're like, why is this person over here so jolly? And, you know, like, it's just, I don't know. It's just like, it's just nice to enjoy life. Like, you don't really only get one that we know of. So why not fulfill it to the, the most high? So, yeah. yeah three. So last question, then the rapid fire. Mm-hmm. Is there someone you would like to publicly acknowledge or express gratitude to someone who has been instrumental in your artistic journey? Yeah. Um, shout out. A lot of folks know him. He really like one of the, he's one of those uh, that everybody knows. I don't know how he knows all these people, but he knows. <laughs> shout out Elliot Perry. Um, that man really changed my life. Um, like when I met him, one, he was, like, one of my first serious collectors. Like, he has, like, a couple of my works in his collection. Um, and I think it's important because I didn't have that growing up. Like, I didn't have that many people that believed in believed in me. Um, so just, like, to have him, like, he, did, he didn't really know me at that moment. But, like, he found me. We, we, we got into conversation. He introduced himself. And then, like, he was just like, dude, like, whatever you need, mm-hmm. I'm here. So just like to have that belief and to have that person, to have him really like care for me in my practice. Um, and then once I met him, like the door really just like flung open and I met all these amazing people mm. uh, and everything that they, you know, could bring into my life. Mm. Thomas Moore is another person. Um, Thomas Moore? Thomas Moore, like. Yeah. I always joke around a lot. Like, I'm like, damn, every time we go somewhere, this man know everybody in the room. Even when you can't <laughs> know somebody, he knows somebody. So it's just like, you know, shout out to them dudes. Like, they really looked out for me in my career, and they really, like, opened the door for me, and, like, so, so much. Like, I'm forever indebted. So, yeah. Uh, and I think I think it's important that, you know, like, younger artists and artists that are that are older that's kind of, like, kind of getting their footing uh, within their space. It's just, like, again, like, you never know who's watching, um, and you never know who can help you out. So try to be as humane as possible. Um, because you never know who can help you out, who can bring you to the next level. Um, so shout out to them guys and many more. Yeah, shout out to them. And and I hope somebody takes from that and 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 decides to really become a part of an artist that you're you're looking at, that you want to get to know them. It, it takes support. This is 
this is one of those industries, man, that it takes so much love and support around you. Mm-hmm. And it also takes, it takes them being selfless. Yeah. It takes them being incredibly selfless to say, you know what? Although I really enjoy this work and I do want it in my collection, I want it in my home. But man, collectors is is more than the word collector. It 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 involves so much. And when you decide to do that seriously and you decide to really take that on, because it's a practice in itself. Right. And um those that understand that as a practice and understand the role, it it's it's indispensable. Yeah. It's indispensable. And I know so many people, and I, I'm not an artist. I don't, you know, but collectors have collectively changed my life as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just speaking on the artists that I work with. And when they, like, we, I keep coming back to this word, but when you find people that have integrity, mm-hmm. you got to hold on to those people. And you have they're to, genuine. They're, they're, they got to be genuine, but Man. you got to be genuine back. Absolutely. And I think that's a lesson for these for 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 artists is be genuine back. Mm-hmm. There, it's not just they're not just it's not just two grand in your pocket, right? You know what I mean? That's not that's not what it is. You got to build relationships, and it can't be based on they bought my work. Absolutely, that it Absolutely. cannot end there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Shout out to the you know shout out to the collectors that really care for artists. Um. I mean, shout out to all collectors, really. Like, yeah, I'm not hating on nobody, but you know, special shout out to the ones that really care about you know the artists that they collect work from. Um, and it's just more than art to them. Yeah, um, it's really more than art for a lot of the artists that are creating those pieces. So, yeah, I'm glad that you all can share that moment or share that space. Yeah. So, you ready for these questions? I think so. All right. <laughs> okay. So it's a quick answer. I'm right, gonna try. All right, hip hop or R and B? Hip hop. Country music or R and B? R and B. All right, Haitian food or Southern food? Be careful. <laughs> Haitian food, y'all. Haitian food. I'm sorry. Oh, right. hey, hey, hey. A lot of similarities. I ain't gonna lie, but yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. I, I mean, I, you know what? I, I've never, I've never even had Haitian food, so <laughs> I'm just partial. No, nah, that's crazy. That's I should have told you that maybe we could have went and got some Haitian food. Nah, you should have told me we would have went somewhere. I know, I should have told that's you. That's actually crazy. I know, I've never had Haitian. You know, I did. It, it, I don't think there are any Haitian food places in Houston. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I promise. No, there might be, but like New York, Miami, you know. Boston, like there's a lot of Haitians out there, so I'm yeah, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. Dang, that's crazy. I know I should have said something. All right. You AOL dial up <laughs> or high speed internet. <laughs> high speed internet. High speed internet. Okay, okay. I mean, of course. What was, what was the other one? AOL dial up. What is that? What? What is that? Dial up? You never when it it's like <laughs> I low key remember because I was born in '96, so like I kind of know, but like, <laughs> oh man, maybe I'm serious there. Like, I'm just not remember. Like, like, I used to use my dad's computer. He had a little, a little office in the computer. That yeah. computer is so give me high speed internet any day, any day. <laughs> All right, any day. handwritten notes or text messages? Text message. Boston streets or New York City skyline. Boston streets, because I don't care about the skyline. I don't care. Okay, well, let me reword that. Boston streets or you York, New York streets? Hey, I love Boston. <laughs> New York streets, but there's so much more. There's so much more out there for me. I'm sorry. Okay, so traditional canvas mm. or experimental surfaces? Traditional canvas. I tried. I tried it all though. Black and white or full spectrum color? Full spectrum color. Jazz influences or modern beats? Um, jazz influences. Okay. Group exhibition or solo show? And that's a hard one. <laughs> that's a hard one. I'm going to go solo exhibition. Solo. Marvel or DC? Marvel. It depends. Early mornings or nights in the studio? Nights in the studio. What's your personal favorite piece? What's the name of it? Uh... I got one at the moment. What is it? 
I don't think I have one at the moment. Oh, you don't have one at this moment. Okay, okay. So we're gonna pass on that one. Yeah, I don't have one at the moment. Most um, memorable moment in your artistic career. That's a good one. Um, I went, I went, I went. Um, uh, a couple. There's a couple actually, but the first ones I went down to Miami for the first time. For, um, our boss weekend with my fiance. Did you? So, not this year. No, that was last year. Last we went down last year, so that was like our first time really in that space, and it was just like a, a surreal moment. Um, because like these moments I dreamed of, and I was like, damn, we that we out here. So yeah. So we're working on something really special together. We are. We I'm are. I'm excited about that. Are you excited? I'm looking forward. I'm really looking forward. Like it's. I mean, it's something that. I've, I mean, I'm always looking forward to new experiences, and this is one of them. So yeah. I can't. I'm pretty pumped. So am I. So we'll tell them about that a little bit later. We're not gonna get into it right now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Y'all, y'all gonna have to wait. They got away. They got away. You know, we'll 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 recap. We've we've been on. We've talked for an hour and thirty minutes. I hope they're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, this is for my folks that like to just listen to voices in the background. This right, <laughs> exactly. That's me. Well, it's been really good talking to you. It's been good spending time with you over the last, I would say, two months and mm. getting to know you. We always have a really solid conversation. So I think this is going to turn into a lifelong thing. You know, sure. we we end up meeting some people, some people you just vibe with. So I right. appreciate your presence. I appreciate you for being here, and I can't wait to tell them what we're working on. Well, you're much appreciated. You're always appreciated. Thanks for holding space for these conversations. And, you know, thanks for allowing me to share my story. Wrapping up our conversation with Demetrius Wilson, we ventured deep into the essence of vulnerability and creativity, uncovering what propelled him into these deeply personal moments that resonate through his work. We've navigated through the realms of his aspirations from immediate goals to ambitious dreams that span a lifetime. My time with Demetrius has been nothing short of enlightening. It's a rare and refreshing encounter to meet an artist that embodies both exceptional talent and genuine integrity. Demetrius shared his vision of excelling as the paramount artist of his generation, revealing an ambition that fuels his journey. His advice to fellow artists emphasized the balance of being selfish to your dedication and your craft and also selfless to the art community. That was a highlight of our discussion. Our rapid fire session let us know that he prefers Haitian food over Southern food. That didn't rub me the right way, but it's cool. For those of you who have not experienced in Tender Peaks, Grace Unfolds, I hope you have an opportunity before March 15th. If you want to learn more about the artwork or the artist, or if you would like to inquire, just send me an email at info at eliseartgroup.com. I want to thank y'all for joining us today. It's been the absolute privilege to talk with Demetrius, to get to know Demetrius, to spend time with him when he was in Houston, and to spend time with you guys. I want you to stay tuned for our next conversation with Megan Lewis who is also another remarkable talent. I can't wait to get deep into her artistry with you guys. Now, if you made it all the way to the end and you enjoyed this video, you make sure to subscribe. Your support means the world. Until next time, peace.